Chapter Three of Days with Great Poets. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Bob Gonzalez. Days with Great Poets by May Clarissa Gillington Byron. Chapter Three A Day with Keats. About eight o'clock one morning in early summer, a young man may be seen sauntering to and fro in the garden of Wentworth Place, Hempstead. Wentworth Place consists of two houses only. In the first, John Keats is established along with his friend, Charles Armitage Brown. The second is inhabited by a Mrs. Braun and her family. They are wooden houses, with festooning draperies of foliage and the clean countrified air of Hempstead comes with sweet freshness through the gardens, and fills the young man with ecstatic delight. He gazes around him, with his weak, dark eyes upon the sky, the flowers, the various minutiae of nature which mean so much to him, and although he has severely tried a never-robust physique by sitting up half the night in study, a new exhilaration now throbs through his veins, for in his own words, he loves the principle of beauty in all things, and he repeats to himself, as he loiters up and down in the sunshine, the lines into which he has crystallized for all time sensations similar to those of the present. A thing of beauty is a joy forever. Its loveliness increases. It will never pass into nothingness, but still will keep a bower quiet for us and a sleep full of sweet dreams and health and quiet breathing. Therefore, on every morrow are we wreathing a flowery band to bind us to the earth, spite of despondence, of the inhuman dearth of noble natures, of the gloomy days, of all the unhealthy and o'er-darkened ways made for our searching. Yes, in spite of all, some shape of beauty moves away the pall from our dark spirits. Such the sun, the moon, trees old and young, sprouting a shady boon for simple sheep. And such are daffodils, with the green world they live in, and clear rills that for themselves a cooling covert make gainst the hot season. The mid-forest break, rich, with a sprinkling of fair musk-rose blooms. And such, too, is the grandeur of the dooms we have imagined for the mighty dead, all lovely tales that we have heard or read, an endless fountain of immortal drink pouring unto us from the heaven's brink. Nor do we merely feel these essences for one short hour. No, even as the trees that whisper round a temple become soon dear as the temple's self, so does the moon, the passion poesy, glories infinite, haunt us, till they become a cheering light unto our souls, and bound to us so fast, that whether there be shine or gloom or cast, they always must be with us, or we die. Endymion. Yet John Keats is in some respects out of keeping with the magnificent phraseology of which he is the mouthpiece. Little Keats, as his fellow medical students termed him, is a small, undersized man, not over five feet high, the shoulders too broad, the legs too spare, death in his hand, as Coleridge said the slack, moist hand of the incipient consumptive. The only thing of beauty about him is his face. It is a face, to quote his friend Lee Hunt, in which energy and sensibility, that is, sensitiveness, are remarkably mixed up, an eager power wrecked and made impatient by ill health, every feature at once strongly cut and delicately alive. There is that femininity in the cast of his features, which Coleridge classed as an attribute of true genius. His beautiful brown hair falls loosely over those eyes, large, dark, glowing, 
which appeal to all observers by their mystical illumination of rapture, eyes which seem as though they had been dwelling on some glorious sight, which have, as Hayden said, an inward look perfectly divine, like a Delphian priestess who saw visions. And he is seeing visions all the while. Some chance sight or sound has wrapped him away from the young greenness of the May morning, and plunged him deep into the opulent color of September. His prophetic eye sees all the apple buds as golden orbs of fruit, and the swallows that now build beneath the eaves, making ready for their departure. And these future splendors shape themselves into lines as richly colored. Season of mists and mellow fruitfulness, close bosom friend of the maturing sun, conspiring with him how to load and bless with fruit the vines that round the thatch eaves run, to bend with apples the mossed cottage trees, and fill all fruit with ripeness to the core, to swell the gourd and plump the hazel shells with a sweet kernel, and pump the hazel shells with a sweet kernel, to set budding more and still more later flowers for the bees, until they think warm days will never cease, for summer has o'erbrimmed their clammy cells. Who hath not seen thee oft amid thy store? Sometimes whoever seeks abroad may find thee sitting careless on a granary floor, thy hair soft lifted by the winnowing wind, or on a half-reaped furrow sound asleep, drowsed with the fume of poppies, while thy hook spares the next swath and all its twined flowers, and sometimes like a gleaner thou dost keep steady thy laden head across a brook, or by a cider-press with patient look thou watchest the last oozings hours by hours. Where are the songs of spring? Ay, where are they? Think not of them. Thou hast thy music, too, while barred clouds bloom the soft dying day, and touch the stubble plains with rosy hue. Then in a wailful choir the small gnats mourn among the river sallows. Born aloft, or sinking as the light wind lives or dies, and full-grown lambs loud bleat from hilly bourn, hedge crickets sing, and now with treble soft the red breast whistles from a garden croft, and gathering swallows twitter in the skies. Autumn the voice of Charles Brown at the open window, hailing him cheerily, breaks the spell. Keats goes in, and they sit down together to a simple breakfast table, and Brown quizzes Keats, as the current phrase goes, on his inveterate abstractedness. The young man, with his sweet and merry laugh, defends himself by producing the result of his last night's meditations in praise of the self-same wandering fancy. Ever let the fancy roam, pleasure never is at home, at a touch sweet pleasure melteth, like to bubbles when rain pelteth. Then let winged fancy wander through the thought still spread beyond her, open wide the mind's cage door she'll dart forth and cloudward soar o oh, sweet fancy let her loose summer's joys are spoilt by use and the enjoying of the spring fades as does its blossoming autumn's red-lipped fruitage too blushing through the mist and dew cloys with tasting what do then Sit thee by the ingle, when the sere faggot blazes bright, spirit of a winter's night, when the soundless earth is muffled, and the caked snow is shuffled from the ploughboy's heavy shoon. Fancy, high commissioned, send her, she has vassals to attend her. She will bring, in spite of frost, beauties that the earth hath lost, 
she will bring thee all together all delights of summer weather all the buds and bells of may from dewy sward or thorny spray all the heaped autumn's wealth with a still mysterious stealth she will mix these pleasures up like three fit wines in a cup and thou shalt quaff it fancy breakfast over the business of the day begins and that with keats is poetry and all that can foster poetic stimulus he takes no real heed of anything else a devoted son and brother one ready to sacrifice himself and his slender resources to the uttermost farthing for his mother brothers sister and friends yet he has no vital interest in other folks's affairs nor in current events nor in ordinary social topics other people's poetry does not appeal to him except that of shakespeare and of homer whom he does not know in the original but who through the poor medium of translation has filled his soul with grecian fantasies much have i travelled in the realms of gold and many goodly states and kingdoms seen round many western islands have i been which bards in fealty to apollo hold oft of one wide expanse had i been told that deep-browed homer ruled as his demean yet did i never breathe its pure serene till i heard chapman speak out loud and bold then felt i like some watcher of the skies when a new planet swims into his ken or like stout cortez when with eagle eyes he stared at the pacific and all his men looked at each other with a wide surmise silent upon a peak in darien sonnet this is what he wrote after sitting up one night till daybreak with his friend cowden clark shouting with delight over the vistas newly revealed to him and from that time on he has luxuriated in dreams of classic beauty warmed to new life by the sorcery of romance immortal shapes arise upon him from the infinite azure of the past and he sees how deep in the shady sadness of a vale far sunken from the healthy breath of morn far from the fiery noon and eve's one star sat gray-haired saturn quiet as a stone still as the silence round about his lair forest on forest hung about his head like cloud on cloud no stir of air was there not so much life as on a summer's day robs not one light seed from the feathered grass but where the dead leaf fell there did it rest a stream went voiceless by still deadened more by reason of his fallen divinity spreading a shade the naiad mid her reeds pressed her cold finger closer to her lips hyperion he is studying french latin and especially italian all with the view of furthering his poetic ability though no great reader he has soaked himself in the atmosphere of old italian tales and the very spirit of medieval florence breathes from the story borrowed from boccaccio an echo in the north wind sung which narrates how the hapless isabel bid away the head of her murdered lover then in a silken scarf sweet with the dews of precious flowers plucked in araby and divine liquids come with odorous ooze through the cold serpent pipe refreshfully she wrapped it up and for its tomb did choose a garden pot wherein she laid it by and covered it with mould and o'er it set sweet basil which her tears kept ever wet and she forgot the stars the moon and sun and she forgot the blue above the trees and she forgot the dells where waters run and she forgot the chilly autumn breeze she had no knowledge when the day was done and the new moon she saw not but in peace hung over her sweet basil evermore 
and moistened it with tears unto the core. Isabella Keats has brought himself with difficulty, however, to the perusal of modern poets. His boyish enthusiasm for Lee Hunt's work has long since evaporated, and after reading Shelley's Revolt of Islam, all he has found to say is, Poor Shelley, I think he has his quota of good qualities, but for the rest he is not attracted to any kind of knowledge which cannot be made applicable and subservient to the purposes of poetry, his own poetry, for his one desire is to win an immortal name, and he has begun life full of hopes, fiery, impetuous, and ungovernable, expecting the world to fall at once beneath his pen. Poor fellow! Hayden's diary. But men of genius, Keats himself has said, are as great as certain ethereal chemicals, operating in a mass of created matter, but they have not any determined character. That indefiniteness of literary aim, that want of will-power, without which genius is a curse, which have hampered the young man all along, are now still further emphasized by the restlessness of a passionate lover. John Keats cannot stay indoors this fine May morning, fitting himself for verses fit to live, when the girl who is to him the incarnation of all poetry is visible in the next-door garden. He throws down his pen and hurries out to join her. Contemporary portraits of Fanny Braun have not succeeded in representing her as beautiful, and at first sight Keats has complained that, although she manages to make her hair look well, she wants sentiment in every feature. Propinquity, however, has achieved the usual result, and now the young poet believes his inamorata to be the very apotheosis of loveliness. He is never weary of adoring her sweet voice, sweet lips, soft hand, and softer breast, warm breath, light whisper, tender semitone, bright eyes, accomplished shape. If the truth be told, Fanny Braun is a fairly good-looking young woman, blue-eyed and long-nosed, her hair arranged with curls and ribbons over her brow. She has a curious but striking resemblance to the draped figure of Titian's sacred and profane love, and for the rest she is by no means poetic or sentimental, but a voluminous reader whose strong point is an extraordinary knowledge of the history of costume. She accepts the homage of Keats, much as she accepts the fact of their tacit betrothal, and the fact that her mother disapproves of it, without taking it too seriously in any sense. And now, though not particularly keen on open-air enjoyment, she accepts his daily suggestion of a walk with her, and they go out into the beautiful meadows which were part of Hempstead a hundred years ago. Keats is in his glory in the fields. Always the humming of a bee, the sight of a flower, the glitter of the sun, have seemed to make his nature tremble. Then his eyes flashed, his cheek glowed, his mouth quivered. Peculiarly sensitive as he is to external influences, his chief delight is to think of green fields. I muse with the greatest affection on every flower I have known from my infancy. The man, who is so soon to feel the daisies growing over him, takes one of his intensest pleasures in watching the growth of flowers, and now as an exquisite music notes that pierce and pierce descends through the young green oak leaves the poet seizes this golden moment of the May world and transmutes it into song. My heart aches, and a drowsy numbness pains my sense, as though of hemlock I had drunk, or emptied some dull opiate to the drains one minute past, and lethe words had sunk. Tis not with envy of thy happy lot, but being too happy in thine happiness that thou, light-winged dryad of the trees, in some melodious plot of beechen green and shadows numberless, singest of summer in full-throated ease. Oh, for a draught of vintage that hath been cooled a long age in the deep delved earth, 
tasting of flora and the country green, dance and Provencal song and sunburnt mirth. Oh, for a beaker full of the warm south, full of the true, the blushful hippocrene, with beaded bubbles winking at the brim and purple stained mouth that i might drink and leave the world unseen and with thee fade away into the forest dim fade far away dissolve and quite forget what thou among the leaves hast never known the weariness the fever and the fret here where men sit and hear each other groan where palsy shakes a few sad last gray hairs where youth grows pale and spectre thin and dies where but to think is to be full of sorrow and leaden-eyed despairs where beauty cannot keep her lustrous eyes or new love pine at them beyond to-morrow thou wast not born for death immortal bird no hungry generations tread thee down the voice i hear this passing night was heard in ancient days by emperor and clown perhaps the self-same song that found a path through the sad heart of ruth when sick for home she stood in tears amid the alien corn that same that oft times hath charmed magic casements opening on the foam of perilous seas in fairylands forlorn forlorn the very word is like a bell to toll me back from thee to my soul self adieu the fancy cannot cheat so well as she is famed to do deceiving elf adieu adieu thy plaintive anthem fades past the near meadows over the still stream up the hillside and now tis buried deep in the next valley glades was it a vision or a waking dream fled is that music do i wake or sleep ode to a nightingale the poet is recalled from these rapturous flights to the fugitive sweetness of the present he is wandering in may meadows young and impetuous on fire with hopes and his heart's beloved beside him it is almost too good to be true i have never known any unalloyed happiness for many days together he tells fanny the death or sickness of some one has always spoilt my home i almost wish we were butterflies and lived but three summer days three such days with you i could fill with more delight than fifty common years could ever contain he talks to her earnestly of his dreams his aspirations his ambitions and then the sordid facts of everyday life begin to cast a blighting shadow over his effulgent hopes what has he indeed to offer worth her taking a young man of twenty-three ex-dresser at a hospital who has abandoned his surgical career without adopting any other with slender resources and no occupation beyond that of producing verses which are held up to absolute derision by the great reviews i would willingly have recourse to other means he tells her again as he has told his friend dilke i cannot i am fit for nothing else but literature he talks of taking up journalism but in his heart he feels unfit for any regular profession by reason both of physical weakness and a certain lack of system in mental work the future becomes blackly blankly overcast the rays augusta domi descend like a curtain between the sublimity of keats and the calm common sense of fanny they turn homewards in silence the poet revolving melancholy musings but when the melancholy fit shall fall sudden from heaven like a weeping cloud that fosters the droop-headed flowers all and hides the green hill in an april shroud then glut thy sorrow on a morning rose or on the rainbow of the salt sand wave or on the wealth of globed peonies or if thy mistress some rich anger shows imprison her soft hand and let rave and feed deep 
deep upon her peerless eyes she dwells with beauty beauty that must die and joy whose hand is ever at his lips bidding adieu and aching pleasure nigh turning to poison while the bee mouth sips i in the very temple of delight veiled melancholy has her sovereign shrine though seen of none save him whose strenuous tongue can burst joy's grape against his palate fine his soul shall taste the sadness of her might and be among her cloudy trophies hung ode to melancholy fanny brawn enters her mother's house and john keats goes into his room and sits down brooding brooding oh he says that something fortunate had ever happened to me or my brothers then i might hope but despair is forced upon me as a habit and he is only too well aware that although he is naturally the very soul of courage and manliness this habit of despair is growing upon him and eating his energy away a wintry chill settles down upon the maytime and his misery finds vent in lovely lines in a drear nighted december too happy happy tree thy branches ne'er remember their green felicity the north cannot undo them with a sleety whistle through them nor frozen thawings glue them from budding at the prime in a drear nighted december too happy happy brook thy bubblings ne'er remember apollo's summer look but with a sweet forgetting they stay their crystal fretting never never petting about the frozen time ah would twere so with many a gentle girl and boy but were there ever any writhed not at passed joy to know the change and feel it when there is none to heal it nor numbed sense to steal it was never said in rhyme yet keats is young and youth means buoyancy with an effort increasingly difficult he is able to shake off this sombre fit for a while and he makes use of the simplest means to that end whenever i feel vapourish he has said i rouse myself wash and put on a clean shirt brush my hair and clothes tie my shoestrings neatly and in fact adonize as if i were going out then all clean and comfortable i sit down to write these very prosaic methods adopted he abandons himself to the full flood of inspiration and lets his mind suffuse itself in antique glory as in dimion he receives the divine commands of the passionately bright moon lady as she stoops at last to bless him and as she spake into her face there came light as reflected from a silver flame her long black hair swelled ample in display full golden in her eyes a brighter day dawned blue and full of love endymion or as lysias he succumbs to the serpentine grace of lamia or as porphyro hidden in the silence watches madeline at prayer a casement high and triple arched there was all garlanded with carven imageries of fruits and flowers and bunches of knot grass and diamonded with panes of quaint device innumerable of stains and splendid dyes as are the tiger moth's deep damasked wings and in the midst mong thousand heraldries and twilight saints and dim emblazonings a shielded scutcheon blushed with blood of queens and kings full on this casement shone the wintry moon and threw warm ghouls on madeline's fair breast as down she knelt for heaven's grace and boon rose-bloom fell on her hands together pressed and on her silver cross 
soft amethyst, and on her hair a glory like a saint. She seemed a splendid angel newly dressed, save wings for heaven. Porfiro grew faint. She knelt, so pure a thing, so free from mortal taint. Eve of St. Agnes But the inspiration does not well up today. Its flow is frustrated, in view of the mountainous difficulties which hedge him in. Ill health, stinted means, hopeless love, and continual lack of success. These are calculated to give the bravest pause, and presently Keats, snatching a few hurried mouthfuls of lunch, is off to the studio of his friend, the painter Hayden, the one man among all his acquaintance who is capable of really understanding him. He sits down, morbid and silent, in the painting room. For a while, nothing will evoke a word from him, good or bad. But his keen interest in matters of art, and the entry of various friends one by one, Wentworth Dilke, Hamilton Reynolds, Bailey, and Lee Hunt, soon arouse him to animated conversation. Keats is shy and ill at ease in women's society, but a delightful combination of earnestness and pleasantry distinguishes his intercourse with men. He says fine things finely, jokes with ready humor, and at the mention of any oppression or wrong rises into grave manliness at once, seeming like a tall man. No wonder that his society is much sought after, and himself greatly beloved by these genial spirits. No wonder that here, at least, he meets with that appreciation of which elsewhere his genius has been starved. In this young fellow of twenty-three, who unites winning affectionate ways and habitual gentleness of manner with the loftiest and most nobly worded ideals, few would discover that imaginary Johnny Keats, the apothecary's assistant, upon whom the Blackwood reviewer had lavished such vials of vituperation. He is here openly acknowledged as one of the bards of passion and of mirth, and his poems are each accepted as not a senseless tranced thing, but divine melodies of truth, philosophic numbers smooth, tales and golden histories of heaven and its mysteries. No one else in English poetry, save Shakespeare, has in expression quite the fascinating felicity of Keats, his perfection of loveliness. Matthew Arnold But only these few friends of his are able to recognize that perfection. Outside their charmed circle lies an obstinately unappreciative world. The afternoon wears on, and the friends disperse. Keats, returning to Wentworth Place, flushed with hectic exhilaration, finds a veritable douche of cold water awaiting him, in the shape of a letter from his publishers. They refer to his unlucky first volume of poems brought out in 1817. By far the greater number of persons who have purchased it from us, they say, have found fault with it in such plain terms that we have in many cases offered to take the book back rather than be annoyed with the ridicule which has time after time been showered upon it. In fact, it was only on Sunday last that we were under the mortification of having our own opinion of its merits flatly contradicted by a gentleman who told us that he considered it no better than a take-in. For a few minutes the pendulum swings back to despair. A man whose whole business in life is the creation of the best work who never wrote a line of poetry with the least shadow of public thought, who believes that after his death he will be among the English poets, and that if he only has time now, he will make himself remembered, that such a one should be merely the butt and laughing stock of his readers? It is an unendurable position. Not that Keats attaches undue importance to popular applause. Praise or blame, he says, has but a momentary effect upon the man whose love of beauty in the abstract makes him a severe critic on his own works. In Endymion I leaped headlong into the sea, 
and thereby have become better acquainted with the soundings, the quicksands, and the rocks, than if I had stayed upon the green shore and took tea and comfortable advice. I was never afraid of failure, for I would sooner fail than not be among the greatest. But what will Fanny think of such a letter? He falls to miserable meditation over the slings and arrows of outrageous fortune, and the constant erection of new obstacles in the course of his luckless love. And of Fanny's love he always has had a smouldering doubt. Yet he remains her vassal, from the first, as he has told her, irrevocably her slave. He conceives himself an outcast on the wintry hillside, exiled from all his heart's desires. Ah, what can ail thee, wretched wight, alone and palely loitering? The sedge is withered from the lake, and no birds sing. Ah, what can ail thee, wretched wight, so haggard and so woebegone? The squirrel's granary is full, and the harvest's done. I see a lily on thy brow, with anguish moist and fever dew, and on thy cheek a fading rose fast withereth too. I met a lady in the meads, full beautiful, a fairy's child. Her hair was long, her foot was light, and her eyes were wild. I set her on my pacing steed, and nothing else saw all day long and sideways would she lean and sing a fairy's song. I made a garland for her head, and bracelets too, and fragrant zone. She looked at me, and she did love, and made sweet moan. She found me roots of relish sweet, and honey wild, and manna dew, and sure in language strange she said, I love thee true. She took me to her elfin grot, and there she gazed and sighed deep, and there I shut her wild, sad eyes, so kissed to sleep. And there we slumbered on the moss, and there I dreamed, ah, oh, woe betide, the latest dream I ever dreamed on the cold hillside. I saw pale kings and princes too, pale warriors, Death pale were they all, who cried, La belle dame sans merci hath thee in thrall. I saw their starved lips in the gloam, with horrid warning gaped wide, and I awoke, and found me here on the cold hillside. And this is why I sojourn here, alone and palely loitering, though the sedge is withered from the lake and no birds sing. La belle dame sans merci. And now he hears the voice of his belle dame ringing light across the garden. While he sits here, a prey to every distress, she is gaily gossiping with her next-door neighbor Brown. At once the unhappy Keats is tormented by a thousand jealous fears. Fanny is transferring her affection to Brown, of that he is quite certain. He rushes out, his black looks banish the much-amused brown, and very nearly produce an immediate rupture between Fanny and himself. But, after a few bitter words, he permits himself to be reassured, or is it cajoled, and tells her, I must confess that I love you the more, in that I believe you have liked me for my own sake and for nothing else. The poor boy, from the worldly point of view, has nothing else to offer. The lover's quarrel is over for the nonce. Visitors begin to drop in for the evening. There is music and singing in Brown's little drawing-room. Keats is very fond of music, and can himself, though possessing hardly any voice, produce a pleasing musical effect. He will sit and listen for hours to a sympathetic performer but his ear, like all his faculties, is abnormally sensitive, and a wrong note will drive him into a frenzy. As the room grows fuller, he becomes restive. The poetical character, he has observed, is not itself. It has no character. When I am in a room with people, 
the identity of everyone in the room begins to press upon me, so that I am in a little time annihilated. In the light chit-chat of small talk and badinage he has no part. It bewilders and annoys him. Those about him, especially the women, seem to show up in their worst colors. Fanny herself appears, as he has described her at their first meeting, an absolute minx, and presently he contrives to slip stealthily away, and seats himself in some quiet chamber, alone with the darkness and the May scents of leaf and blossom. I hope I shall never marry, he groans once more. The roaring wind is my wife, and the stars through the window panes are my children. The mighty abstract idea of beauty I have in all things stifles the more divided and minute domestic happiness. I do not live in this world alone, but in a thousand worlds. No sooner am I alone than shapes of epic greatness are stationed round me, and serve my spirit the office which is equivalent to a king's bodyguard. The young man now lights his candles, and takes up a familiar and favorite occupation, the writing of a long letter to his brother George in America. This epistle is, as one might expect, almost entirely concerned with the art of poetry. What else has Keats to write about, whether from the side of technique or inspiration? He dwells on the adroit management of open and close vowels. He shows how the poetry of earth is never dead. He discusses the need of constant application to work, and how the genius of poetry must work out its own salvation in a man. And meanwhile, as fitful strains of song reach him from the distance, and his roving gaze rivets itself upon a Wedgwood copy of a Grecian vase, one of Brown's chief treasures, the fleeting wafts of sound, and the lovely symmetry of shape, and the golden chain of figures, blend themselves into one harmonious whole of word music. Thou still unravished bride of quietness, Thou foster child of silence and slow time, Sylvan historian, who canst thus express A flowery tale more sweetly than our rhyme. What leaf-fringed legend haunts about Thy shape of deities or mortals, or of both, in Tempe or the dales of Arcady? What men or gods are these? What maidens loathe? What mad pursuit? What struggle to escape? What pipes and timbrels? What wild ecstasy? Heard melodies are sweet, but those unheard are sweeter. Therefore ye soft pipes play on, not to the sensual ear, but more endeared, Pipe to the spirit ditties of no tone. Fair youth, beneath the trees, Thou canst not leave thy song, Nor ever can those trees be bare. Bold lover, never, never canst thou kiss, Though winning near the goal, Yet do not grieve. She cannot fade, Though hast not thou thy bliss, Forever wilt thou love and she be fair. Ah, happy, happy boughs, that cannot shed your leaves, nor ever bid the spring adieu, and happy melodist, unwearied, forever piping songs forever new. More happy love, more happy, happy love, forever warm and still to be enjoyed, forever panting and forever young, all breathing human passion far above, That leaves a heart high sorrowful and cloyed, A burning forehead and a parching tongue. Who are these coming to the sacrifice? To what green altar, O mysterious priest, Leadst thou that heifer lowing at the skies, And all her silken flanks with garlands dressed? What little town by river or seashore or mountain built with peaceful citadel is emptied of its folk this pious morn. And little town, thy streets for evermore will silent be, and not a soul to tell why thou art desolate can e'er return. O oh, attic shape, 
fair attitude, with breed of marble men and maidens overwrought, with forest branches and trodden weed, thou silent form dost tease us out of thought as doth eternity. Cold pastoral, when old age shall this generation waste, thou shalt remain in midst of other woe than ours, a friend to man, to whom thou sayest, Beauty is truth, truth beauty. That is all ye know on earth, and all ye need to know. Ode to a Grecian Urn The shapes of epic greatness throng closer and mightier around him. The storm and stress of the day's thoughts have utterly drained his small reserve of strength. Outworn by the vehemence of his own conflicting emotions, John Keats lays his aching eyes and dark brown head upon his arm as it rests along the table and sinks into a dreamless slumber of exhaustion, while a happy melodist, unwearied, forever singing songs forever new, the nightingale chants on outside. End of chapter 3 Recording by Bob Gonzalez